Okay, thank you. Como vai? How's everybody today? It's a pleasure to be back in Brazil. And I'd like to thank the organizers, Padre Geraldo, for inviting me here. I've been coming to Brazil a long time. Uh, working with the therapeutic communities and the drug prevention movements like Moria and Cigente around the world for over 30 years. Padre Geraldo gave me a phone call. He said, we have a very special conference my friends are going to have called Fremont. I'd like you to come down and speak. He said, okay. And I told Padre that what I wanted to do is, uh, as I spoke in Brazil a lot, work a lot of prevention treatment programs, work with the Therapy Committee Federation here, and the Mori Gente. I would speak about, I wanted to speak about drugs, but in a different way, uh, a different aspect drug problem in the world. Because everyone here heard about drugs, heard about crack. We want to put it in a different perspective, to try to talk about different things maybe people haven't discussed before about the movement. And but the uh, so before I start, I'll tell you a little story we do at the therapeutic community conferences. It's a story, okay? We, as many world conferences that we have as Padre comes to the conferences. And there was this millionaire had millions of dollars and he wanted to study the secret of motivation. Because in our field where we work, motivation is very important. Overcoming addiction is a very difficult process, but it can be done. The person must be motivated, the staff member must be motivated. This millionaire wanted to study find out what is the secret to motivation. There's many motivated people, but he couldn't find out what's that one ingredient that makes a person motivated. So he'd go to conferences around the world. He went to therapy community conferences because there were many people in recovery, and he knew that they were very motivated people, and maybe they could provide him the answer. And he never got the answer. So what he did, he sponsored the conference, and he sponsored a reception after the conference. So what he did at one of these large conferences, and this has gone on for 25 years, and he doesn't have an answer. What's the secret to motivation? And so he has a conference, and he has 2,000 people there. And at the end of the first day, he sponsors a reception. And Padre Geraldo and I and everyone is there. And there's an Olympic-sized swimming pool at this conference. And he fills the pool with alligators and piranhas. And he makes a challenge. And he said, anyone who will jump in this pool and swim from one end to the other and come out in one piece, I give you a million dollars in cash. He wants to find the secret to motivation. Reception goes on for two hours. Nobody goes in the pool. This millionaire's getting depressed. He's old, near the end of his life. He's not going to find the secret to motivation. He's tried every way he could, but couldn't get an answer. All of a sudden, we're standing there, and there's this loud splash. And there's a staff member from Padre Geraldo Institute in the pool, swimming for his life. It was looking at him and goes, this Padre Geraldo Institute staff member took the challenge. And this guy's swimming, and there's alligators snapping at him. There's piranhas nipping at his feet, nipping at his hands as he's swimming. We don't think he's going to make it. This is an Olympic-sized pool. He makes it to the end of the pool. It's out of the pool. His clothes are all torn, but there's not a scratch on him. He succeeded taken up the challenge. This billionaire was so excited, he wanted to find out, you know, what motivated this guy. He almost fell in the pool himself trying to run and go around to see this young staff member. And he comes up to him and he said, son, you're the first person in 25 years took up my challenge. I have 20, I have a million dollars in cash I'm going to give you, it's yours, but first you have to tell me, I've been waiting my whole life. What's the difference between you among all other people? What separates you from everybody? What is the secret? for motivation. What motivated you amongst thousands of people over 25 years that took the challenge? What is the motivation that you had that you took up this challenge and go in that pool? And he said, Padre Geraldo pushed me in. <laughs> and what that says is, for motivation, the field that we work in, prevention and treatment, sometimes you have to push the staff. They have that talent or that client in treatment. They have the ability. 
but you can't wait for them. They've got the talent, you've got to push them a little bit. Okay? You have to push people along. Here is an end to the story. That staff member from Padre Rollo Institute, he returned to Camp Venus. He turned in his resignation. He didn't need to work anymore. He had a million dollars. And to this day, Padre Geraldo is still waiting for a donation from that person. <laughs> so I wanted to tell you uh, really, really quickly, uh, I've known Padre Geraldo for 30 years. And the way I first found out about him is he wrote a book on gangs, on the criminal gangs. When I went to the university, it was required reading. And it was Padre Geraldo set up the first anti-gang program, the first successful program in the United States to address gang members, to rehabilitate gang members, you know, put them from fighting each other, from killing each other, from committing crime. He was, been, he was very famous, everyone knows President John Kennedy, well, his brother Robert Kennedy, the famous U.S. Senator, was also a, at this time early in his career, he was a staff member on a congressional committee. And as part of that congressional committee, that's when Robert Kennedy was investigating organized crime, the mafia, the Italian organized crime in the United States. He also had another committee, he was chief of staff, where they studied gangs. It was on juvenile delinquency. And Padre Geraldo, for Bobby Kennedy, and for that committee, was the number one speaker who they'd send around the United States. And the Knights of Columbus sponsored the speaking tours. The speak had to develop a successful gang program. And then Padre Geraldo left the United States, come down to Brazil. We don't know what happened there. Teen Christian leadership, Mori Exigente, thousands of therapeutic communities, pastoral leading sobriedad. He created a lot of things. Like we say in the United States, you know, God created everything in the world. God created the most things. Padre Geraldo created the second most things in the world. Have been, been very successful. What I want to do is I want to first. Uh, I was lucky. I first got to meet Padre Geraldo, who was at a World Therapeutic Beauty Conference in Athens, Greece, of all places. But he's from Texas. I'm from New York. I studied at the university. I get to meet him in Greece. That's a that's a big pleasure. When I met him, he actually said to me, how do you know about me? He said, I read your book. And he said to me, nobody reads that book. And I said to him, it's required reading. You, you, you should have made some money off of this book. I mean, because in every university, it teaches criminology in the US. It's required reading. So it was, uh, but he gave up that book for free, which was very good. OK, what I wanted to talk about in for drugs over here before I get into crack. We'll start with, with uh, the drugs first. We all know here that you know, drugs is a very serious prob problem worldwide. We know the devastation that drugs cause. You work on the front lines in the prevention or treatment programs. You see it every day. You see it with the crack cocaine problem down here. When we think about the problem in the world, it seems like almost everybody's using drugs, right? You hear about it, the publicity about it, all the negative news about it. But if you take a look at the drugs, the United Nations, they conduct surveys on drugs. They look at surveys in all the countries, many countries in the world, Brazil, United States, Thailand, all conduct surveys. And every year, the United Nations puts out a special report on the world drug problem that summarizes all the surveys to give an estimate of how many people in the world use drugs. And what that survey basically shows you can see is that we have about, at the bottom here, it averages 5%. 5% of the world's population uses drugs. 95% don't. Okay? And number one use drugs is cannabis or marijuana. Okay? And we show it graphically here that 95% of the people in the world do not use drugs. For Brazil, uh, the UN reports on all the countries. And the recent UN World Drug Report shows that 98.5% of the people in Brazil do not use drugs. It's only 1.5% use drugs. Okay? But what that shows you 
is how devastating the problem is. You see how devastating drug is every day that you deal with it, the problems that crack cocaine actually causes. But what we see from this is that fortunately it's only 1.5%. Now, when I see these figures, the first thing that comes to me is 95% of the world is not using drugs. 98.5% of the people in Brazil are not using drugs. Why would anybody want to legalize? And we know the problem that drugs causes, the devastation that it does to 1.5% of the population. Why would we want to expand that even more? Okay, it does not make sense to legalize drugs when actually 95% of the world are not doing it, 98.5% of people in Brazil are not doing it. That tells us one thing. The second thing that it tells us is that we know there are thousands of prevention and treatment programs in Brazil. They have to be successful. You have to be successful in what you're doing. Because if you weren't successful, if you weren't doing a good job, that little figure of 1.5% would be a lot larger. So that means that a lot of the work that you're doing is bearing fruit. It is very successful. Because you're able to keep this problem at a very small 1.5%, though it's very devastating. Okay, now what I wanted to jump into is with crack cocaine. Because this is a difference between this crack cocaine epidemic than the one we last saw in Brazil in the 1990s and the United States in the 1980s. And to understand the current crack problem, it's, it's important to understand, you know, how this crack cocaine is made, the pharmacology of cocaine as we speak. It all starts with a coca leaf, and from the coca leaf, they add to it gasoline, battery acid, or kerosene. That's designed to extract the cocaine molecule from the coca leaf. You have to get that out of the coca leaf. And that forms a paste called, I guess, pasta base or cocaine base paste, which is very addictive. Some people in cocaine producing countries smoke this base, smoke this paste base. It's very addictive, it's very impure, it causes a lot of health problems. And then from cocaine paste, they use some chemicals to clean it up and they create cocaine base. Okay, now cocaine base and cocaine paste you can only smoke. It's very dirty because it still contains a lot of chemicals from the manufacturing process. Now most of the world uses cocaine hydrochloride. You can't smoke cocaine hydrochloride. You inhale it through the nose, it cannot be smoked. So the cocaine base is cleaned up with acetone, with ether, to create cocaine hydrochloride, which is a primary form of cocaine that people inhale. Now, in the United States in the 1980s, in places like England and Jamaica, when crack cocaine first became available, the way crack cocaine was made, you had the cocaine hydrochloride. You could not smoke cocaine hydrochloride. So you took common baking soda, added it to the cocaine hydrochloride, and then converted it back to cocaine base, but in the form of crack, those little rocks that you see, and that can be smoked. This was a very clean form of crack cocaine, but it was very devastating and very addictive still. Okay, versus regular cocaine, crack cocaine, you know, it only, because it's smoked, the cocaine goes to your lungs and directly to the brain. It only takes five seconds to get a high from crack. Regular cocaine takes five minutes. The crack cocaine high is very intense, but it only lasts for about five minutes. The cocaine high, or cocaine hydrochloride, lasts 20 minutes. But crack is so addictive, and the high is so powerful, that it only lasts five minutes, that the person smoking crack immediately goes into depression and has severe anxiety because they want to repeat that high. And that's why they smoke crack over and over and it becomes a very addictive drug. Now, in the United States, we had in England, in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, we had this problem in the 1980s. In the 1990s, crack started appearing in Brazil. 
and it was still the crack that was made from cocaine hydrochloride. In Brazil, the traffickers were taking it, clean cocaine hydrochloride, adding baking soda to make crack. Still very addictive. However, the demand for cocaine hydrochloride, the inhaling cocaine, which mainly used in the United States and Europe, the demand is going down for cocaine hydrochloride. United States, cocaine hydrochloride, cocaine use has been cut in half. It's dropped by 50% since 2006. In Europe, cocaine use has been going down. But the cocaine traffic has made so much cocaine base, that all of a sudden they don't have a market to create this cocaine hydrochloride. So they're sitting there with all this cocaine base. Had to do something with it. This cocaine base started coming south. It came down to Brazil, to Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Chile. It went on the trafficking route to West Africa. And so what happened was, the second crack epidemic is made with a form of cocaine base. It's not from clean cocaine hydrochloride and converted fat. It's made directly from cocaine base that has a lot of impurities in the cocaine manufacturing process. So I've spoken with a lot of treatment professionals here in Brazil, and they have said that many of the crack addicts that they see have a lot of health problems compared to the actual last time that they had a crack epidemic. A lot of this is due to, it's a very impure and dirty form of crack. It's still highly addictive, but there's more impurities in it from the cocaine manufacturing process that's affecting health. That's the difference from the last crack epidemic. Okay? And so, you know, they use it in two ways here. One, you use a cocaine base, the powder, which you put on a cigarette and smoke it in the curl merlin. Or you can convert it into that rock form, and which is the most predominant form of crack cocaine. But so there's actually more to this. There's more of a public health problem with this crack. And that's why a lot of people have been seeing, you know, more health problems with the crack addicts today than they did yesterday. It's because when traffickers make a drug, they never sell you a pure drug. They want to make a profit. So they add other substances to the drugs to dilute the drugs so they can make more money. In the past, around the world, they would add substances that were not dangerous. They were sugars, a sugar like mannitol or lactose. They would add that to the drug, but that would not have an effect on the user. However, there's been a trend over the last 10 or 15 years where the drug traffickers are using a lot more dangerous substitutes to put into drugs, to bulk, to make the drug, to beef up, uh, to make the drug larger, to cut the drug. They call them adulterants. Except they're not using things like mannitol or lactose. They're using substances such as phenacetin and levamisol. I get into that in a second. It explains a lot of the health problems with crack cocaine today. Uh, in the United States, we work with Sanad, the National Drug Secretariat. We work with the Brazil Federal Police on many projects worldwide. Uh, just a, a second, I'll let you know. We, we work with Sanad. Uh, we both work with the World Health Organization and the United Nations. We sit on, Paulino and I sit on a committee with the United Nations and World Health Organization designed to treatment standards worldwide. We also sit on a committee, which I'll get into a later, on child addiction. I'm talking about for the first time in the last two years we've seen child drug addiction. I'm talking two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old. It's never been seen before. There's a reason. But there's no treatment protocols for children. So Paulino and I are sitting on an international panel to develop the world's first treatment protocols for children. We also work with another regional organization called the Organization of American States, which is in the Western Hemisphere. All the Latin American countries, the Caribbean, the United States, Canada, and Mexico belong. And there's a drug commission called CCAT. And uh, we all sit on the CCAT commission. And with uh, CCAT, Paulina was the chairperson of the commission that developed the Hemispheric Drug Demand Reduction Strategy. The Organization of American States Strategy for Prevention and Treatment. And Brazil also uh, sat on a special committee of the OAS. It was an expert committee on drug demand reduction. And Brazil now has the chair of that. So the United States and Brazil, we work together on a lot of projects, not just in Brazil, 
go worldwide, trying to develop new methods for treatment and prevention, uh, trying to develop the first treatment methods for children addicted to drugs that first appeared two years ago. But one of the studies we have done, work with the Brazil Federal Police, to find out what is in crack cocaine, besides the impurities from the original cocaine manufacturing process. And this is over a year and a half ago, found out that 35% of the crack samples analyzed had finacetin, 11% had levamisole. And last year, we did, let me, yes, but last, last year we had a conference in Tampa, Florida. We had Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, United States, and West Africa. All the countries experiencing this new crack cocaine. We analyzed samples again. And in those samples, we took a few samples from Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And in Brazil, 65% of the samples now had finacetin. In Paraguay, 65% had finacetin. In Uruguay, it was 22%. We also had 22% levamisole. And you know, what is the danger of this? It becomes very important. Finacetin used to be used in aspirin in the 1960s. Finacetin has been banned in many countries worldwide. It was put in aspirin to reduce fever and to reduce pain. But what happened was, over time, people developed kidney failure and bladder cancer from finacetin. Okay, so finacetin was banned. Unfortunately, drug traffickers have found out that finacetin is their perfect cutting agent to put with cocaine because as a powder, it looks like cocaine, its texture is the same. When a person inhales it or smokes it, they get a buzz that's almost, or hot, it's not a high, but it gives a feeling to them that makes them think they have cocaine. Unfortunately, it's very destructive. Levamisole was used in veterinary medicine. It's used to get worms out of cattle, or worms out of horses in it. It's not meant for humans. 25 years ago was tried in a cancer trial for humans, but it didn't work. What they found out with humans, it depletes white blood cells. When you deplete white blood cells, that's the same thing that HIV AIDS does. You deplete the white blood cells, you're open to infections, to disease. Now, HIV AIDS, that's permanent. If you use levamisole, it's temporary. But as long as you use a levamisole, you deplete white blood cells open to all sorts of infections and diseases. So this is explaining why the current generation of crack addicts are coming to your treatment programs with many health problems, a lot of health problems that they have. And the reason is it's a very, beginning with, like I said, it's a very impure form of crack that hasn't been converted first to cocaine hydrochloride and cleaned up and then converted back to crack. This is raw, impure, cocaine base, and then it has finacetin and levamisole added to it. And some samples also have things like lidocaine and benzocaine. If you have a rash, usually lidocaine or benzocaine is used for that rash to take the itch out of that rash, to take the stinging out. But if you smoke it in a powder form, that can damage your lungs. So crack cocaine is being adulterated or being cut with finacetin, levamisole, lidocaine, and benzocaine. That is making the current crack epidemic very complicated. Now it presents a challenge to you in the treatment programs because, before I do this, this is something about, just to show you, give you an idea. I had a photo of an aspirin. An aspirin used to contain finacetin. Usually an aspirin's about the size of your fingernail or half the size of your fingernail. Uh, the crack cocaine, the rock of crack cocaine, that's maybe twice the size of your fingernail. Now take an idea, when people took finacetin, the aspirin, like 30 years ago, before it was banned, you know, for fevers, you had a fever to take aspirin. You didn't have a fever was sick all the time. Maybe you took the aspirin three, four times a day for three days, and your fever's gone. You didn't get sick for six months later. So really, people weren't taking that much aspirin. But however, over time, it did cause kidney failure and it did cause, cause bladder cancer. It shows you how destructive finacetin is. With crack cocaine, 
It's not like aspirin people take. When the addict takes crack cocaine, it's very addictive. They're smoking that rock of crack cocaine that's twice the size of an aspirin. They smoke at least 10 of those rocks a day, every day of the week, okay, for months at a time. That's the addiction of crack cocaine. You can imagine the amount of phenacetin and levamisole and lidocaine that a crack addict is ingesting inside their system. If that aspirin, over many years, caused kidney failure, bladder cancer, levamisole depleted white blood cells and caused a lot of diseases and infections, you can imagine smoking this crack every day for weeks at a time. What are the public health effects from this? If aspirin frequently used cause kidney failure, bladder cancer, what is this crack cocaine doing that's cut with phenacetin and cut with levamisole? That's the challenge that's being looked into now, that's being researched right now. Okay, because, however, there are no tests for it. What are the challenges in the treatment program you have besides treatment of crack cocaine addict? Many therapeutic community members have told me, at some of the courses I've been to, that they're seeing problems, diseases, infections they've never seen before with crack addicts. When a person comes into your treatment program, no one has the budget. Say you have 50 clients in your treatment program, and say they use crack. It'll be very expensive to send all of your 50 clients to a public health clinic to have a kidney test done, to have a test done in their bladder, to have a, a blood count test done to check white blood cells. You don't have a budget for that. That costs a lot of money. But how can you screen your crack addicts to know whether they've been exposed to these toxic chemicals? Now, tests that we have for drugs, there's urine tests for drugs. You know how they test for urine? You know, they have these strips over here. You see this has six strips over here where they call them panels. Now these are tests done for drugs. They're like for heroin, cocaine, they have one for crack, for amphetamines. They haven't been done for the toxic ingredients or the adulterants that have been added to drugs. What we're doing now, we're working with the Crack Cocaine Project. We have with Sanat, the Organization for American States, and the Brazil Federal Police, and some university people from Johns Hopkins University, the University of Florida, to develop the first urine test in the world where you don't test for drugs, but you test the client where they've been exposed to phenacetin or levamisole. When we have these developed, it will be a few months before we have them developed, they only cost a few hayites. We want to develop these worldwide because all around the world, drug traffickers are adding toxic ingredients to drugs. There's no way for the treatment programs to know. You send them to a health clinic, it costs you a lot of money. So if you have 50 clients that use crack, you don't know who's been exposed to phenacetin. But if we can provide you with a very cheap and effective urine test, it only costs a few hay ice, we can take a urine sample and dip those strips in, and if it shows positive, that maybe only, say, 10 of your clients tested positive, then you would send those 10 clients further testing at a health clinic. It would save you money, because you need to know what your clients have been exposed to. You can't send them all to a health clinic and spend all that money, and maybe only 10 have been exposed, but you need to know whether there's been damage to their kidney, to their bladder, whether their white blood cell count is low, which is going to be subject to many infections in that. So we need a very cost-effective method for you and other treatment programs around the world to be able to provide a service to their drug addict to test for any health problems that they have. And this is one of the innovative projects that we're working on now with SNAG and the Organization of American States. We want to get into real quick another aspect of crack cocaine. And to say, what does Afghanistan have to do with this or Kabul? Nothing with crack cocaine. What we're talking about is a phenomena of child addiction that I spoke to you before about. With the child addiction, we've just started seeing this for the first time in the world over two years, in the last two years. We're talking about children from two to eight years old actively using drugs. There's a reason for this. It only happens when there's a tremendous supply of drugs. In Afghanistan, 93% of the opium poppies are in Afghanistan. 93% of the opium, 93% of the world's heroin are produced in Afghanistan. As a result, it is very cheap. It costs it very cheap. So therefore, children can afford the drug. In the surrounding countries, India, Nepal, Pakistan, we're starting to find 
children, five, six, seven, eight years old, smoking opium and smoking heroin. Fortunately, they're not injecting the heroin, it's very pure, but you have five, six, seven, eight year old heroin addicts because the heroin and opium is so plentiful that it, it's cheaper than the paint thinners and the glues that a street kid will typically use, whether it's in Asia or Latin America. So now the children find out they got a more potent drug, opium and heroin they can use, and it's cheaper than the paint thinners and glues. What happens over here in our hemisphere here, because of that oversupply of cocaine base that was produced, was a tremendous amount of cocaine base that you can make crack from that came south into Brazil and Paraguay and Argentina and into West Africa. And it only cost about two hayites or even less. So the street children, unfortunately, sometimes crack is just as cheap as paint thinners and blues. And so you have five to eight year olds getting involved with crack cocaine use because there is so much of this drug that has ever been seen before. And it's a big challenge because no one has ever dealt with child drug addicts before. <coughs> and the damage that will be done, their systems are just developing, their heart, their lung, their brain. So physiologically and health-wise speaking, there's going to be a lot of damage done to their systems, their health systems. There's going to be damage done psychologically to them. We don't know the full extent. So we got together with the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the Organization of American States, some leading universities around the world, and with you know, certain U.S. State Department, Sinaj, certain drug secretaries, to come together to put together the world's first treatment protocols for children, which we're working on now. Need to be done. Okay, so that's so, so that, so that different, so the similarities that we have is certain parts of the world, in Asia, in Latin America, because of the oversupply of opium and heroin or of cocaine base and crack cocaine, children are able to afford the drug now. And that is another challenge, another aspect of the crack cocaine problem. Made from an impure form of cocaine base, it's cut with toxins such as phenacetin and levamisol, and some of it is so cheap that children are able to use it now. And there's another aspect of this to be aware of, especially people who are talking about prevention messages, people that deal with substance abuse treatment. You could be exposed to crack cocaine, become addicted, without even smoking it directly. And this is done, as you know, with cigarettes. You've heard secondhand smoke. People get exposed to cigarettes. Like both my parents died of lung cancer because they smoked cigarettes. They smoked four packs of cigarettes a day for 30 years. I never smoked but I have to have x-rays done every year if I get severe bronchitis because my lungs are infected by that secondhand tobacco smoke. And every year I have to get x-rays done. And next to a while I get severe bronchitis. Never smoked in my life, but that's from secondhand contact with it. Well, the same that that happens with, with tobacco, the same thing happens with cocaine smoke, the same thing happens with opium or heroin smoke. So a lot of studies were done on secondhand contact with tobacco. So we did a study in Afghanistan. We went into homes, and most people live in mud huts, okay? And they're not ventilated, okay? But they have a lot of carpets and a lot of rugs to keep the place warm. There's no ventilation in there. And the parents smoke. And what happens is all that smoke gets in the air. All that smoke gets on the carpets or on the rugs where the children sleep. It gets in their pillows, it gets in their blanket. And we've done special studies. We sampled the air in the hut, and we sampled the hair of the children. And we sampled their bedding, their blankets. We found it saturated with opium, saturated with heroin. And these children didn't take opium or heroin directly. They were exposed to it by inhaling it from where their parents smoked, and from touching it, they absorbed it through their skin. Now, usually to see the numbers here, the number should be 300. Usually a hardcore heroin addict or a hardcore cocaine addict, we call this picograms per milligram, should have 300 in their system. As you can see, some of these children have thousands of picograms per milligram. And that's not taking it directly. That's inhaling it in the air or touching it or they sleep on their pillow, absorb it through their skin. Well, the concern about crack cocaine, there are many favelas in Brazil. And there's people that smoke in favelas. Many people 
all together, crammed together in a very small favela that is or a very small house or a very small house or shanty that is not ventilated either. And so you're having people who are not directly smoking crack, but are being exposed to the smoke and being exposed to the residue of the carpet mat. And there's the same threat here in Brazil with smoke cocaine that there is in Afghanistan with smoke heroin and smoke opium. Because in these small environments where people are smoking and there's no ventilation, the children can be exposed to this crack cocaine and become addicted to it. So that is another threat. So what, one thing I wanted to do is also to talk to you about, people ask about treatment. You know, is treatment effective? A lot of treatment, there's been a lot of studies done worldwide. And people say, well, can we have success with crack cocaine? It's very devastating. And the answer is yes. You know, we have success with heroin, with amphetamines, with cocaine, with marijuana, because dozens of studies done worldwide over the years on the effectiveness of treatment, where they follow a client, when they enter treatment and exit treatment, before and after, shows reductions in drug use. We summarize studies here from Peru, from Thailand, from Vietnam, Colombia, <laughs> El Salvador, Afghanistan, these are the first treatment programs ever in Afghanistan, United Kingdom, United States. What it shows is that treatment works. Treatment is effective. Okay? And an important thing, like Paulina had spoke about, is, is to provide services for treatment, to keep upgrading the skills of the treatment staff members, keep upgrading skills of prevention providers so they have the latest evidence-based techniques. So therefore, we know treatment works. Research shows it. But with all the challenges we're coming up with new drug addicts and new drugs, we have to keep improving the science of our treatment. We have to improve the training that we do to keep pace with the changes in the world. And that, that's what's being done. So the point is, there's a reason why only 95% of the people in the world use drugs, only 98.5% but don't use drugs. And in Brazil, 98% don't use drugs. A lot of it is because treatment and prevention works. The programs that you do work. One of the close out with is, besides treatment and prevention, there's a lot of public awareness messages about the dangers of drugs that are done on TV, in the news media, that you see. I just wanted to highlight that I've looked around the world and I've seen some ones that were effective. So I wanted to find out like what's one of the most effective drug prevention messages that can be used, either on posters, on TV. Back in the 1980s in the United States, they did one where they take an egg that represented a brain, they put it in a frying pan, and when it sizzled and heated up, they said, this is your brain on drugs, you know, drugs fry your brain. Okay, it was a, a creative way on TV to get a message across. But in some countries, you know, they don't have TV. Places like Afghanistan, there's no TV. And 90% of the people don't read and don't write. So how do you get a message across? You get a message across that you street theater, you have people go out, actors go out on the street, they act out a message, or you have posters you can give and posters tell a story. This one, don't blow opium smoke into your children. Some people in Afghanistan give opium to their children to keep them quiet. Or don't smoke around the children because they could inhale that smoke from the air. So it's another innovative way that was done to uh, basically give a message that drugs don't work. You've seen another one, I've seen one of these other ones was kind of interesting. You know Spongebob, you know, the cartoon Spongebob? I saw this one. People put this one out. I've seen this, I'm on crack, Spongebob is on crack. And a lot of people down here like this cartoon. Well, but, but really, I look at this and trying to figure out, you know, he lives under the water, right, the ocean. I was able to light a crack pipe under the water. It shows you crack addicts, what, how motivated they can be to figure out something. But the most important thing is, you know what the most effective poster I've ever seen for not to use drugs? I've seen a lot of posters around the world. But there's one poster that I've seen, and people see it, they stop using drugs automatically because it shows you what drugs make people do. And every time you show this to people, they stop. And so what I did, you know how Padre Geraldo makes the card of a lady of Guadalupe and hands them out? Well, I made a card of this, this poster that I'm gonna show, which is a very effective poster that convinces people not to use drugs. And I, I hand this out wherever I go around the world. I say, Mr. Tom, why shouldn't I use drugs? And I show a child, and I say, or a teenager, I say, you see this poster? You see what drugs make you do? 
And they give me the drugs right away. They give up. They don't want to use drugs. It's the world's most effective poster for not using drugs. Right over here. Drugs make you do strange things. <laughs> See this poor guy? See what drugs? You don't know up from down, right hand from left hand. See, when I was doing this, I know Project Roll to a long time. He's looking at me, and I said, I have the most effective poster on drugs, and I have it on a card. He was telling me to get me a thousand of these. You still want them? Okay. So what I wanted to conclude with, I wanted to talk about that, basically, that yes, there's a problem with drugs in the world. Yes, there's a problem with crack cocaine over here. And, and to talk about the differences of crack cocaine, the different challenges that this crack epidemic has, how pure, how toxic the crack is, how children can have access to it, but basically also to leave a message that very fortunately, only 1.5% of people are using drugs in Brazil. And that is because, basically we spoke about motivation, to keep you motivated that the work that you do is very successful that your efforts in prevention and treatment and public awareness are very effective. Because if they were not effective, there would be more than 98.5% of people not using drugs. So my message to you is, you, know, you have my admiration, you have my respect for the tremendous job that you are doing. Because even though drugs are very serious, and your crack problem is very serious, if you look at the UN World Drug Survey, you have one of the lowest drug rates in the world compared to other many nations. And that's because of the work that all, the tremendous work that all the people in this room here do today. So I'd like to thank you, you know, for that work that you do. Again, it was a pleasure to be here and to speak to you again in Brazil. Thank you.